All right, here we are. I have Sarah Court and Laurel Beversdorf with us talking all about strength, talking all about a lot of really good things. So let's get right into this. Sarah and Laurel and I have known each other in the same yoga worlds for, I feel like a very long time. I don't know how long years we've been circling around each other, offering very similar things. And I've always appreciated what they offer and how they bring different movement education into yoga asana. And I've seen them in the last couple of years, especially focusing on strength training and love, love, love that. But personally, selfishly, I love it because now they are doing, instead of ha girl summer, it was bulky, bulky girl. girl summer. Having that little ch- tongue in cheek subversiveness around the traditional messages of strength training and women who do strength train are we going to get bulky oh no bulky what does that mean and all these things and it's really so it's like doubling down and let's all have a hashtag bulky girl summer so this is what i love about the two of you of you know you bring this nice lightness and care into the education that you do so that's my wonderful introduction for you i'd love to have you two just give yourself a quick little intro as well sarah let's start with you Sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us on your it's podcast. It, it's it is always funny when you, you know, meet a person. I mean, we're not even really meeting because we're still over <laughs> video. Right. But I, this is our first sort of like live encounter and that whole thing of like, oh, I think I know this person. But actually, I, I've just been following them on social media, and interacting with them that way. I, like That's as much as I know. Uh, but, yeah, no, it's, it's fun to get to talk to you uh, live finally. Uh, so but about me, I am a physical therapist. I live in Los Angeles. Um, so with in that regard, I see patients and clients live in person or I see them over Zoom. Um, but Laurel and I together have something that we call that is called not which is we call it movement logic. And uh, we created it. It started in 2017. We did a bunch of tutorials together. And then we've we've sort of had a shift in 2023 where we basically a lot of the things that happen with Laurel and myself is one of us will text the other one, Hey, why don't we do fill in the blank? And then the other one texts back, Oh my God, I was just thinking that like, that's how our podcast started because we'll be like, I think you texted me like we should do a podcast. And you were, and I was like, hell yeah, we should do And blah. so we sort of, it was in the water for us. You know, it was sort of like, it was sort of like we, it was just kind of around us in the way that we were working and things we were thinking about and talking about. And also the way that I, you know, to go back to being a PT, it is how I work with my patients. I, above probably everybody in the clinic that I, where I work, um, I'm the one taking everybody next door into the gym and making them use barbells. Like it was sort of in the, in the cards for me to do this as well. But so the, together, the two of us made our barbell lifting program, um, for women. And we can talk more about that, but, uh, Yeah, I just, um, I came from being a yoga teacher initially, and that started in 2005. So that's, oh my God, almost 20 years ago. Uh, And, you know, sort of developed through that profession, developed through my profession as a PT, and kind of all of those influences, Pilates influence, yoga influence, strength, rehab, all mixed together in the way that I work with people, whether it's a rehab setting or whether it's like, I just want to get stronger or I want to build better bones or, or whatever it may be. Laurel, Thanks. introduce yourself. Hi, thank you so much for having me on, Bree, and, and us on to talk about all things strength. I am Laurel Beversdorf and I started teaching yoga in about 2008 and ended up you know, having a very fulfilling career as a yoga teacher, teacher trainer, there was one small problem, which is that it was kind of a large problem. I had a lot of hip pain and I didn't know what to do about that because it seemed like it was coming from my yoga practice, which then I'm teaching people yoga and I'm also training teachers to teach yoga. And so I've started to wonder, oh gosh, is it this practice that's causing me pain? And am I you know, basically handing a practice to people that will cause them pain. And so I think that a lot of people can relate to that narrative. I think a lot of us have undergone this learning curve of like, all I do is yoga. I have pain, maybe yoga's to blame. And then coming around, thankfully, to this idea that no, it's not. (laughs) And that yoga is a practice and it has so many benefits and wonderful things to offer. And we those of us who love yoga know that it changes lives 
and it uh, enhances our life in so many measurable and immeasurable ways. But eventually we come to understand that human biology, um, in order to remain healthy and robust and capable, needs to be challenged in different ways that perhaps the practice of the asanas uh, just doesn't, and that's okay, right? So I stepped away from this mindset of, you know, yoga is to blame for my problems and entered into this mindset of curiosity about well, what is it that I'm missing here? What is it that I don't understand? And where can I learn more? And what that involved was actually stepping outside of the yoga community, which was antithetical to what I thought I was supposed to do. Um, but I did it and I learned about strength training and I started to meet with a personal trainer and then I started training at the gym and a lot changed for me. Um, one thing that didn't change is that I did not stop practicing yoga. I continued to practice yoga and strength train. <laughs> so it's a, a both and situation. Um, and since, you know, strength training helps me so much to feel better in my body, I wanted naturally to share that. So I am now a yoga teacher and a personal trainer. And Sarah and I, <clears throat> something that we saw was missing in the world of women i'll just say <laughs> i, like I almost said yoga world but i was like no the world of women yeah. is uh, this understanding that we can lift heavy things we can build muscle we can make our bodies physically stronger and in order to do that we need to i think be given permission to lift heavy stuff, um, not given permission as in like now you have permission, but like maybe a better way of saying it is, I think the communication around strength training needs to be delivered differently than it has been in the mainstream, which tends to leave women out. It, or it tends to characterize the type of weightlifting women do as being this thing involving highlighter pen colored tiny little weights and you know nothing more than like five or 10 pounds, and I think we can start to shift the narrative and shift the story around what um, benefits everyone really also tends to be good for, for women too, right? And so women can lift heavy weights just like men. Sarah and I saw this gap in understanding about um, what it takes to build bone density, for example, and ideas around bone density being something that kind of comes from just walking or doing asanas. and you know, we also at the same time are hearing about people who are getting, um, you know, their DEXA scans back or, you know, talking to their uh, general care practitioners, finding out that they have osteopenia or they have osteoporosis and wondering, well, I thought that yoga was enough or I thought that walking was enough or I thought that all of these like lightweight, high rep or just body weight activities that were being kind of sold to women as the only exercise they needed a lot of the time. Um, and, and conversely, the type of uh, exercise that, that women were being sort of fear-mongered to stay away from for various reasons, like you'll hurt yourself if you lift heavy weights, but also you'll get bulky, right? And oh, no, 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 we don't want you to put any muscle on your body because then you won't be attractive to men, right? Um, that's where that hashtag bulky girl summer subversive message comes from. Um, we saw a need and we, we decided, you know what we're going to do? <laughs> we're going to, we're not just going to teach strength training, we're going to teach heavy strength training. And we're going to use barbells to do it because barbells are the most logical tool for being able to progressively overload your strength in order to lift heavy. Now, of course, you know, we start, we start people where they are, but we kind of, I feel took it a step further and was, and we're like, not only should we be strength training and enjoying the benefits of that, but let's actually, let's actually take the leap and decide that we're going to invest in eventually learning how to lift heavy weights too. And Sarah and I were both kind of like, oh my gosh, are people actually gonna wanna do this? Like we're, we're, we're taking a population of people that have been told they should be lifting big dumbbells and we're gonna try to convince them <laughs> that they should lift barbells. I don't know, maybe we should start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm a podcaster, a personal trainer, a yoga teacher, and uh, I'm in cahoots with Sarah Court. <laughs> <laughs> so much goodness in what you both have shared and laurel and especially just that like 
side parallel, right? I think there's a lot of teachers out there where we were like, wait a second, my body hurts or what I was being taught isn't. And then it's hard. And then some of us will be bold enough to have taken that leap and gone outside and educated ourselves in different ways. And I know a lot of the teachers that I work with are maybe stuck in that middle ground of like, oh, but yoga and oh, but this is the way I was taught this asana. And oh, can I do something different? Am I allowed to do something different? But we are allowed to do something different because remember, let's frame this first before we really dive into all things strength training. Like when we're talking yoga, when we're talking strength training, we want to really acknowledge that, of course, the practice of yoga is not the physical. And we, and I appreciated what you said, Laurel, too, about just, you know, yoga is not something that we have to throw away when we recognize, oh, my asana practice isn't giving me everything that I was told it was supposed to give me. It doesn't mean we have to stop doing yoga. These things can be concurrent with each other because they're not the same. <laughs> You know, you know, like they're not on a lot of levels, but our yoga is our yoga and this deep, beautiful practice that was gifted to us from India so many years ago. And may we continue to practice that practice of self-awareness and understanding and collective care and all the things that, that the deeper practices of yoga can give us, which also I find gives insight and helped me when I started strength training 10 years ago, I think it gave me the, the, the encouragement and the confidence and the enjoyment to enjoy being badass, what I felt like was badass and strong lifting heavy things. And it just really served my practice of yoga. My practice of yoga really served that. So they're not the same thing, but they're all beautifully intertwined and enmeshed in my kind of opinion. So I just want to set the stage a little bit for that as a reminder um, before we get into all the fun things. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, to, to, to also kind of create a distinction between the the movement or the exercise or the asanas and the practice of yoga the much more multifaceted multicultural multilingual practice of yoga right we could we could you know extrapolate out the asanas and go well that is actually a form of exercise potentially right because it's stressing the muscles it's stressing the body and and creating change right we we definitely don't want to say like yoga asana can't create change it absolutely can, but the question is, what is the type of change, the magnitude of change we're looking to create and what are the tissues we're trying to change, right? And it tends to be that at a certain point, asanas stop being able to make change to the muscles, but they make some change, right? And I, I mean, it's, incorrect to say that yoga asana doesn't make you stronger. It absolutely does. Like if you weren't doing anything before starting to do the asanas and then you start practicing the asanas and depending on the vigorousness of the practice you're doing, like you're probably going to get stronger. You're probably actually going to build some muscle as well. Um, that right there, starting from that baseline of having that much strength is going to help you learn the exercises and strength training. Absolutely. But there's a very different amount of strength that you can build with barbells or any type of external load that is, you know, more than what you are lifting in your daily life, right? So whatever that is, then what you can build with body weight alone. And then additionally, yoga asana is predominantly a practice where we're pushing our body weight away from the ground. So then we end up missing potentially whole groups of muscles on whole other sides of joints that aren't getting the stimulus that maybe the other muscles on the other side of the joints are getting with the asana practice. So in general, if we're trying to create change to muscle, we will to a point with the asanas, but eventually might need to increase the load. Now, if we're trying to make change to bone, the magnitude required of like resistance to create change to bone is actually even higher. And so that's where we can take our practice of yoga as being this multifaceted, um, rich, diverse practice and go, okay, I want to have better bone density, right? I can continue to practice yoga knowing that it's not the exercise that makes the yoga. And I can introduce these exercises to my weekly movement diet, improve my bone density, and potentially in, you know, Brie and Sarah, like, tell me what you think, like potentially be still engaging in some aspects of the practice of yoga. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I think one of the problems that we've run into 
in, you know, sort of Western society's interpretation of the practice of yoga. Well, not, not so much the interpretation, but the way that it then plays out is I see, you know, the, the, in the reality of it for people in their sort of day to day, they're like, okay, I go to work and then I go to yoga and then I go home. Like they figure out how to fit it into their day. And then, you know, the, the requirements the sort of exercise requirements or the physical fitness requirements that a lot of people are then aware of are things like, you know, cardiovascular health. And so then the yoga, you know, devolves a little bit into like a, I'm going to make this up like, like a core strength power, something yoga. Right. And it's like as exhausting as possible because they've only got that hour to do all that cover all their needs. Right. And so I, in a lot of ways for me, separating out, like, I don't actually go to a lot of yoga classes anymore, partly because as a former teacher, and this is not a, I'm not saying this is what people should be doing, but as a former teacher, I'm just running critique in my head the entire time. <laughs> like, oh my God, we're doing Chaturanga again. Why are we doing a hands? Nobody warmed us up for hand. We're not ready for, oh God. Oh my God. What did she just, you know? So I've, I've learned that it's not actually very a yogic experience for me to go to a yoga class, except for a couple of people. <laughs> And neither one of them lives in this city, but the, the, you know, all of the things that, that Laurel was, were talking about, like all the things we can get from yoga, the, the impact on your entire life is so vast. It's almost like, well, then why are we worrying about this awesome part? Like, why are we so concerned about what we're doing when we're doing the asana, when the yoga practice is about like uh, you know, making changes to the way your brain perceives the world around you, you know, and, and in so many ways, like it's so much, I'll go, I like to go to like restorative yoga now. It's so fun. You just get in on like a nice thing mm. and then you just do your breathing and, like, and then it's time for another pose. I'm like, how fantastic. No, I'm not getting my VO2 max. And no, this is not like my heavy lifting for the week, but it's doesn't, it's not supposed to be. It's not actually supposed to be, right? And I think a lot of the time we've sort of turned it into like, well, this idea that like yoga does everything, so I only have to do yoga, right? But or and and people are generally thinking about the asana when they when they say that. But in some ways, I think it's kind of a relief. Like, let's divorce the two from each other. Let our yoga practice be whatever it looks like, and then also recognize that our bodies, especially women, especially women uh, in their forties, fifties, sixties who perhaps have been doing yoga and maybe Pilates as well their whole life, like actually now really need to step it up in the weight lifting department. That's my thoughts. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. And so, okay. So Sarah, as a PT, uh, yeah. so here in Canada, we say physiotherapist, but I know yes. in the U S it's physical therapist, but as a physical therapist, uh, you do work with, with a lot of different people of 40, 50, 60, and you've seen people who have been doing yoga and Pilates in your clinic. Just talk a little bit more about that, because what you've said previously before is that it's not quite enough and you're actually seeing the effects of not doing quite enough. So let's frame that a little bit for us, please. Yeah. I mean, oh gosh, there's so many ways we could take this, but one of the reasons why that's who shows up in the clinic sometimes is for women in particular, we've been sort of uh, trained to believe that our physical appearance should be a certain way. And that way is, you know, thin and not too muscly. And, you know, that that's sort of our, our, our primary job is to be sort of small and needy and attractive and <laughs> for those reasons. And so for a lot of women, that's, that's been internalized. And, and also there's been a lot of messaging around yoga in particular that like yoga is all, I mean, I used to think that when I first started doing and teaching yoga, that was what I understood. The, all you need to do is yoga. It covers everything. Great. So that's all I did. Uh, but as a physical practice, there is no physical activity that covers everything. There just isn't that covers all of the needs that your body has. Right. And so from a physical standpoint, uh, I'm, I w see a lot of women, you know, in that sort of broad age range coming into the clinic and there are absolute, like sort of, I see what I call like sort of holes in their movement diet. So I'll have them say, I'll have them tell me like, you know, what kind of exercise do you do? And they're like, well, I, I like walking, I go on hikes, 
Uh, I go to yoga, I go to Pilates, but then there's this big gap where I'm like, well, where's the part where you lift anything heavy? Um, and it doesn't even have to be extremely heavy, just anything. Right? And they're not doing it. And the, the biggest issue, you know, for, for, for women in, in this age range in particular is this bone density issue and also, you know, muscle loss issue. And Laurel and I have gotten into plenty of, um, super, you know, valuable and, uh, <laughs> non-toxic conversations with people online about whether or not yoga is enough for your bone density. Um, that's sarcasm. I don't know if you can tell, but so, <laughs> there is still this very, you know, widely held belief that, that yoga is all you need for your bones as well. And, you know, when, when women come in, I'm kind of always making a little file in my head of, okay, at some point, this person may not believe it right now because they're here with shoulder pain or whatever. And if I say, well, what we're going to do is lift barbells, they're going to be like, you're insane and never come back. But I have it in my mind that down the line, we're going to start to lift some dumbbells. We're going to add some weight. We're going to maybe progress to actual heavy lifting because it's really, you know, from a, from a medical, from a physiological standpoint, it's, it's a really, it's, it's something that, that women need to do more of. And it, from my perspective, it would be knowing what I know, it would be unethical of me to just keep someone with like a pink five pound dumbbell for the next 20 years, because I know that that's not going to serve their needs and whether or not the person agrees. I mean, I've had plenty of people that I've tried to introduce to heavy lifting and they're like, uh, I just, I just don't, I prefer Pilates, you know? And I'm like, all right, well, I can't force you to do something you don't want to do. But, um, the, the majority of, of women that I work with, it's super fun to start to introduce them to, like, I have a, I have a patient I'm working with at the moment who, uh, came in with a disc herniation and all of the different, you know, uh, symptoms that, that she had from that. But now we're lifting barbells. And she's like super into it. And I asked her last time as well, I was like, is there anything specific? Like, I was like, I'll just like make you strong. Is there anything specific you want to be working on? And she was like, I would love to do a pull up. And I was like, yes, you know? <laughs> so I do, th I do think it's in the water a little bit. I think women, particularly of this sort of middle age area are, are starting to recognize, they're starting to hear more people talking about lifting weight, um, which is great because, because that's what we want. And there's so much as I'm listening to you talk, Sarah, of, you know, my brain always goes into the cultural conditioning of things. And why do we believe this? And why do women like how you said, Oh, I just feel better doing Pilates and oh, I'm scared to lift weights or whatever. And, you know, so in my mind, I was like, well, what, what are those stories that we've inherited and absorbed from the culture, from patriarchy saying women have to be you know, dainty, sexy, small, whatever the things. I think the literally the first strength class I ever went, I started doing CrossFit like 10 years ago. I don't do it anymore, but that was like my first intro of all things into strength training. And I think probably the first class I was like riding this high for a day, like a few days being like, yeah, ah, I'm so, ah. and then felt my or like shoulders feel so strong. I'm like, yeah, badass. That actually does not change in the last 10 years. I still am like, yeah. <laughs> Lift, <laughs> yeah, I just PR'd my whatever, and right. that the cultural conditioning for for women, right? We have to be good, and we have to be quiet, and we have to be sweet and kind. And I think it's a beautiful place to unleash and on like on a deeper level and rewrite these stories around what it what does it mean to be strong, what does it mean to be badass, to take up space physically. Uh, emotionally, energy, energetically in the world. And so I hope, but yeah, I think the more of us that keep talking about this, like, yes, we need the bone density, the muscles, the, the, like just physiologically, we have to strength train. That's just non-negotiable. But then there's the extra benefits of feeling super badass and feeling and mm. subverting all those stories we've had since we were children that we can't be strong. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is so interesting because as I listen to you both share this perspective of you know, starting to strength train or watching patients start to strength train and kind of come into this feeling of power and strength, like that goes beyond just the physical. I'm reminded of when I started doing yoga in college 
And I was actually coming to yoga as a high school athlete. And so I was familiar with this feeling of physical dominance, of like wanting to be physically dominant. I was not a strength athlete, but I was trying to be fast and powerful and aggressive and coming to the yoga practice. And also I was raised very religious. So that's also important to say. And I was raised in a very small town and I had never encountered yoga before. Right. So I'm coming to, you know, this sort of hippie town on the East coast of upstate New York from like a really small, poor town in Wisconsin. And there's yoga offered at my college where I'm majoring in acting. And I'm like, well, this is going to be great for my acting. And I started doing yoga. And I remember coming into this like similar type of realization or epiphany that like, I don't have to be physically dominant or aggressive or competitive about everything. <laughs> I can do this practice, feel really relaxed and then lie on the floor, do nothing just have this experience where it's me and my mat and I'm not looking at other people and trying to out warrior to them. <laughs> and it's still physically challenging and engaging. And I think that was important for me that I did end up in a class that was physically challenged because I'm, I'm not sure at that point in my life, I would have been able to stick with something like restorative and, and have this like profoundly like relaxed sort of non-competitive, non-physically dominant relationship, relationship with, with my body. body and go, oh, I can be this way too. I can be both ways. And then I don't know, We all, I, I talk a lot about the, the honeymoon phase of yoga where like the first three years are like falling in love. And then something happened when I decided to become a teacher. And I don't know if it was with the teacher training program that I took or if it's the point at which you take something that is a hobby and turn it into a career and all the changes that happen because of that. But at some point, yoga asana, the teaching of it kind of turned into less of a facilitation of an experience for people and like kind of creating conditions for things to happen. And it became more about, in so many words, like trying to control what they did with their body and the stories around that of like, I'm going to make sure that you do the pose just this exact way, because if you don't, you might get injured. I want to make sure you do the pose just this exact way, because that's, you know, even more generically the correct way to do it, whatever that means. Right. And, and, and like coming to this realization, then we like, everything's kind of happening in a spiral of like, we keep coming back to the same themes and ho hopefully your understanding of those themes continues to like be elevated by your life experiences. But coming back to this idea of it being not about control, but about creating conditions for, and, and I, have, I think I've started to maybe articulate this a little different now than I used to creating conditions in which people can increase their tolerance. Now the tolerance we're increasing in strength is different than the tolerance we're increasing in yoga. Probably, probably there's probably a lot of crossover too, but with yoga, I found that I was able to increase my tolerance for there being like two opposing truths existing together at the same time. Right. That like, it doesn't, it's not about right or wrong. It's not about correct or incorrect. It's not yoga is all you need. That's a very, black or white way of looking at the world, right? And it's very reminiscent of my religious upbringing in many ways, right? Where there's like heaven and hell and good and evil, right? But yoga, I think when it's, when we engage in yoga, I don't want to even say like in a particular way, but I think when it's yoga, <laughs> oftentimes what happens is we are, our tolerance for two things to be true at the same time, our, our, our resistance to binary black and white thinking increases, right? Our ability to resist that way of thinking. So I say all of this because I think what's happened with yoga or what is happening in certain communities, right? With yoga is that that's maybe not what they, that's maybe not what's being facilitated. This, this ability to hold two truths that are seemingly opposite or this ability to resist binary thinking. And, and I think that kind of plays into capitalism in a way where, you know, we need people to behave in a certain way in a capital, like people stand to profit 
from the population as a whole, certain people with companies and you know profit margins need, stand to benefit when people believe that it's black and white because that's way easier to market, right? So it kind of, all of it, Sarah and I always come back to this. It's like, it's just, it's like, and I know you do too, Brie, like it's so very much everything kind of, it's in the water, it's in the air, this capitalistic way of kind of commodifying and profiteering off of everything, including women, right? Mm -hmm. Including yoga. Um, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that when we strength train, I think we increase our tolerance to speak out against that. And I think when we practice yoga, we potentially hopefully increase our ability to think critically, to hold to, you know, seemingly oppositional truths, to resist binary thinking. And in this way, like they kind of are, they're so complementary to each other in that more kind of from that sociological, societally kind of um, zoomed out lens. Um, because I know we focus a lot on the biological benefits of both, but I think they, they kind of, they go hand in hand, right? They go, um, I don't know, hand in hand. What's a better analogy? Like we, we are They're not like separate. chocolate and peanut butter. It's biopsychosocial. That, that's what I, that's kind of what I mean. Or chocolate and peanut butter. We are not, our bodies are not separate. Our bodies are not separate from the communities and societies and capitalistic or whatever economies exist and so um i guess what i'm trying to say is, is is when we participate in yoga we participate in in strength training yes we're we're doing different things to our biology um hopefully we're also increasing our tolerance and increasing our ability to resist the ways in which capitalism and everything that comes from that right so the patriarchy racism um Ableism, sexism, ageism, all down the ableism, line, right? All those wonderful that, that, systems of oppression. Yeah. yeah. That these that, that we're able to resist the forces that would move us away from I guess this experience of freedom, maybe from that. <laughs> yeah. I mean there's there's ways in which I could be talking about yoga and not talking about yoga, but uh, having practiced yoga for a long time, I, I do I do feel that it has it has provided for me these in, enduring states, these enduring ways of kind of abiding. I've used that verb a lot as a yoga teacher of, of being in the world. And, and when my yoga practice is working for me, uh, I think that, that one of the things that it provides for me is a type of freedom from these forces that you know are always at play. Um, not that I'm completely immune to them, but that I can kind of think around them a little bit better. I can be a little bit more aware of. Yes. Awakening in a lot of ways, really, which is yeah. like that, that's that, that deeper teachings of yoga, this practice of liberation. And, but you have to know what water you're swimming in. You have to know you yeah. even are swimming in water in the first place. Yes. yes. And that's why I love about yoga is that it just offers that, that lens and then which to view everything and all that we do and how interrelated and interconnected the culture, the society, everything. And these physical, in my opinion and experience, these physical practices like the yoga asana, I actually, I find it in anything. I, I mountain bike. I like in the, my strength training, all the same, these little moments of like awareness of the mind and how I can, but especially the physical side of things of when I'm putting my body into a position on my mountain bike, that's actually a little scary because it's a very steep, rocky downhill and I don't want to die and break anything. Or I'm lifting something heavier than I thought I could. Side note, my I have bad math skills. When I'm strength training, there's been more than enough times where I've miscalculated the amount of weight on the bar. And it's always more, luckily, not less. And so I'll go back. And so I'll do this. And I swear, like 20 pounds heavier. And I'm like, wait, what? Wait, I do right math. And I'm like, did I just do 20? X? Like, so I love it because it's these, like, we're as strong as we think we are or aren't. Putting these things of just like these physical challenges are a beautiful way to embody all of this stuff that we're saying, these, these things of life and whatnot. But let's talk a little bit more. I'm going to shift it slightly to let's get a little bit more nitty gritty. So now I think hopefully everybody's listening going like, yes, yeah, strength training or oh, okay, maybe I'm ready. Let's, how do I do this? And lifting heavy. And of course, always with the caveat, as you both have already explained so wonderfully earlier in the conversation of like, we meet 
ourselves where we are. And for some of us, maybe the body, body weight will always be enough depending on our chronic conditions and whatnot. Like everybody's different. I just want to think about that inclusivity. But if you're somebody who is able to get that little bit more progressive overload and start to bring a little bit more external weights into barbells, into heavy things, let's talk about that a little bit. So I think the benefits are clear. And if we didn't make it clear, we've been talking about this on other episodes here on this little series of the podcast slash just Google <laughs> benefits of strength training, and we're going to see a ton of information, but let's go a little bit more into the how to, and in your experience, I love that you both are very clear and intentional on heavy things. And I agree. And I'm like, <laughs> like, it just, it just it feels so good and it is so good, but I do see how hard it is for a lot of people to get over that hump, that little bit of like, oh, I can't do it. You know, oh, I'm not sure. Or, oh, I'm not strong enough. Or again, like me, just be bad at math and like <laughs> miscalculate. And they're like, actually, I'm stronger than I realized. So how would people get into that? Well, yeah, think, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think one of the things that, I, I think people tend to sort of get stuck on whatever they're doing and either don't think they can progress, don't know they could progress, don't see necessarily that they need to progress. Like for, for me, I, you know, I was practicing yoga. I would go to dance classes. This is maybe like five, six years ago. I would, I would sometimes like pick up some heavy things, but the heavy things were always kind of medium heavy. Like it was never, it was always something that I could pick up like a bunch of times. It wasn't ever something where it was like, oh, I can lift this three times and then I'm done. And that seemed to exist in a world that was other. It was not a world that I knew anything about. I was like a group class kind of a person. I would go to a group kettlebell class and swing a 20 pound kettlebell for, I don't know, however many crazy number of repetitions they wanted me to do it. But I had no concept of how to move from that into something heavier or what that would even look like. And I think that's true for a lot of people. Um, and, you know, I, I, the, the way that I started doing it honestly was, was cause Laura was like, you need to lift barbells. And I was like, Oh God damn it. Okay. <laughs> um, so mostly I just do what Laurel tells me and then uh, it ends up being okay. <laughs> But I think to that point, I think a lot of people do need coaching to get to that place, to get over that hump. I don't think it's, for, especially for someone who's not a, a, a movement teacher, maybe as a movement teacher, you might be like, hey, personal trainer friend, could you like, do you want to trade and I'll teach you some yoga and you can show me how to get into like, you know, technique and stuff like that. But for like the average person to, to, to sort of like make the leap, not even necessarily just to a completely different different piece of equipment and a piece of equipment that for women in particular, we have been told is dangerous and not for us and inappropriate and we could hurt ourselves. So to make that switch on your own, I think would be incredibly hard. So I do think it's a sort of situation where you will benefit enormously from either working with a, a personal trainer and, and being really specific, like, okay, I you know, depending where you are, you're like, well, I've never done a lunge with more than a five pound dumbbell in my hand, but I'm really interested in getting quite a lot stronger. And any trainer with their salt will know how to take you through that progressive overload. Um, you know, so, so something like that, or joining uh, a strength training program that has a goal of progressive overload or <clears throat> joining our bone density program. <laughs> <laughs> if you need someone to teach you how to lift barbells. Yes. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think the bigger picture is like, you need outside help. Like it's for most people, I don't think it's something they're just going to automatically figure out how to do. I know so many people are scared of getting hurt the yeah. minute I start to go heavy and yes. And fair enough when, with that heavier load, I want to make sure I'm doing it in a way that I'm not going to hurt myself when I'm on my own. Step one, if we were to make this linear <laughs> in any sort of way, step one, get professional help in the best sort of way. And then from there, where's that sweet spot of how do I know if I'm lifting heavy enough? 
Yeah, I can speak to that. I also want to say, like, I'm a little bit of a ready, shoot, aim type of a person where I will be like, (laughs) strength training is supposed to be good for you. So I'm just going to go into the gym and like pick up some weights and put them down and just see what happens. I didn't take that approach because I was in pain. So I actually hired a personal trainer. I think it actually is okay to go into a gym and pick up some weights and put them down. And the machines are a fantastic place to start Mm. because they literally tell you how to sit in the machine what movement to do and they don't really let you deviate a whole lot from that and also free weights you know strength training is actually incredibly safe but i think to sarah's point coaching is super valuable because there's been some studies done on like most people in the gym are probably not making progress and that is across you know men women ages Uh, experience levels, right? Like people can go to the gym for a long time and stop making progress because there is actually uh, a way to do it where you're going to be more successful than others. And it's not necessarily super intuitive. Um, But I just wanted to put it out there that like, if you're kind of a wing it type of a person, you're like, I think I'm just going to go to the gym and see if I can get stronger. You freaking go like, do it, give it a shot, see what happens. For me, the buy-in for hiring a coach is really to know that there's some organized plan and that I should see progress. That's another thing. If you're, if you've hired a coach or you're going to a class and you're not seeing progress, right. And this is to your question, Brie, um, what does that progress look like? Right. That's when you may want to switch it up and find, a, you know, someone else to help you because what we, we really need is this concept called progressive overload. And what I love about this concept of progressive overload is that, the difficulty, the way it feels kind of stays the same as you get stronger, but the weights get heavier. Okay. So as your strength increases, there's this really objective way to know that it did, which is that the same amount of weight for the same amount of reps starts to feel a little easier. And therefore you are able to do the same amount of reps with a heavier weight or more reps with that given weight, right? And there's a number of other things that can change when you get stronger, like your form and technique. A lot of people think, first, I have to get the form and technique perfect, and then I can do the exercise well, when in fact, a lot of times the form and technique comes as a result of gaining strength. In fact, one of the first adaptations that takes place in our body as a result of building strength is coordination, improved coordination. So you'll see someone like do an exercise and it kind of looks a little messed up, and then they'll keep doing it and without having to say anything, really they'll get better at it because they simply got stronger, right? Um, but progressive overload. Progressive overload is, it, it's not the changes that you make to your program, it's the changes your program makes to you. And what it means is that we have to continue to stress our bodies at an objectively higher level in order to continue to drive improvements to attributes like strength, or attributes like power or speed or um, even flexibility. Like you could apply progressive overload to so many different types of attributes that you want to develop depending on your goal. And so where we start to see a stall in progress is when, for whatever reason, the elements or the pieces of the program are not being manipulated effectively enough to continue to make a change. And that's when we need to make a change, right? We need to make a change either to the program, to the coach, or let's like really drill into this program and go, okay, you know, how long have you been doing this exercise for? And what is the rep range that you've been doing it at for? And how much load have you been using? And like, let's tweak, let's like turn the dial up on some of these or turn the dial down on some of these or just swap the exercise out completely. Um, Another thing you'd want to ask is like, well, how long have you been stressing your body at about this level? Maybe you actually need to increase the amount that you're doing, right? So you increase volume, maybe instead of doing two sets, you should bump it up to three, right? Everything else can kind of stay the same, but just do a little bit more and you'll start to see changes. There's all these different, I like to think of them like dials that you can turn within a program and exercise frequency, how many times a week are you working out, sets, number of exercises in a workout, load that you're lifting, um, the number of reps you're doing, the RPE, the rating of perceived exertion, like how far into effort are you taking the set? Are you stopping the set 
with the ability to do like 10 more reps, that's probably not going to be conducive to continuing to drive changes to your strength. So let's dial up your rating of perceived exertion. So now you're stopping the set and it feels it's difficult, like on a scale of one to 10, it's like an eight out of 10, right? And that means you could maybe do two more reps or it's a seven out of 10, you could maybe do three more reps. So there's all these different dials that you can turn to continue to progressively overload your strength. The other side of that coin, coin is variety, right? So what happens with, for example, yoga classes or group fitness classes is that we go to the class with this teacher on this day and it's this whole sequence of things and it's really fun, but then we go to either that same teacher on a different day, it's a completely different class with completely different exercises, or we go to a different teacher with completely different, you know, class and exercises. And, and we end up having just a lot of variety and that can be really fun and interesting and engaging. And I'm kind of a variety junkie myself. I like to do different stuff, but what happens then is that we're not able to take an exercise or a we could think of it like a load profile, like the way that this exercise stresses your body in a particular way and turn dials. We're just kind of coming in and coming out and then moving on to the next thing. We're not coming back to it the next week and like, okay, let's hold it a little longer or let's increase the load a little bit more or let's take it a little further into exertion. And I like to equate this with like, it, this is sort of a negative take on variety. I think variety is fantastic. And even a, a good strength program has variety built in, but we can dig a lot of shallow holes and when we progressively overload our strength, whether it's upper body, lower body, push, pull, whatever it is, we tend to want to dig a deep hole in a particular way. So we're going to spend maybe four weeks, maybe eight weeks, even 12 weeks on the same exercise, doing however many sets we're doing. And over those weeks, what we should see is that some of these dials have to be turned up, not because we're like arbitrarily like, oh, let's just make it harder today. But... We actually feel, oh, I'm capable of this being harder. Like this now, what I did four weeks ago feels easy. It's time to turn some dials up. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's like the real basic know-how that you want to have if your goal is to actually get stronger. And like I said, you could go to the gym and try to figure it out. It's not rocket science. It's definitely not. But I find but Laurel, that if you say that, how will people pay for our program if they can just figure it out themselves? Here's what? the thing. Str getting stronger is actually pretty uncomfortable. And so I think what happens a lot of times is that in so many very clever ways, our body, our mind, our behavior kind of helps us not have to work so hard. <laughs> <laughs> and then for me, I have this thing where if there's, just, I'm like, I walk into a gym and if I don't have a plan, I'm like, the tyranny of choice can be overwhelming. I'm like, oh, forget about it. You know, I'm just going to go to this class. So this teacher, like whatever it is, yoga class, hit class, whatever it is, so, like someone just can just tell me what to do. So yeah, for all these reasons, I think coaching is important, but there has to be this progressive overload and you should be seeing changes in the beginning if you're new to strength training they're they're going to be obvious they should be obvious you should obviously feel like after four weeks six weeks eight weeks like oh wow like i objectively notice that i'm stronger because i can lift heavier weights as you get more experienced it's not as fun because the 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 gains as they say come a little they're a little harder to come by but by that time you've enjoyed six, 12, many years of being at this higher baseline of strength, the buy-in is there and you're like, well, I can't stop doing this because I, well, I gotta keep what I have and maybe get a little stronger, right? So. I wanted to say as well, just to talk about this idea of heavy and what heavy lifting is, because it's sort of like a subset of strength training. And I think a lot of people you know, have a sense of like, okay, strength training or resistance training. I have an outside weight or something that I'm lifting or it's a band or whatever it is. And so that's, you know, quote unquote strength training. Um, and the idea of trying to then lift something <clears throat> heavy seems insane for a lot of people because we have an idea of what heavy is as this kind of like blanket experience for everyone or, or blanket <laughs> amount of weight for everyone. Like in my mind, if I'm thinking about a deadlift and I imagine, you know, the power lifter, the Olympics are coming up. And so those guys with like the, they got the belt and their faces are turning purple and they're sweating and they're making crazy faces and the bar bends because that's how heavy it is. Right. I'm like, well, that's heavy. 
And so that's not for me. I don't look like those people. I, I don't have the time in a day to do what they do to get to that. Therefore, that's heavy is not for me. But heavy is a subjective term. Heavy is completely relative. And what I think is fascinating about it is that that subjective relative uh, load goes all the way from like the very beginning of a rehab where I'm giving someone a one pound or a two pound or the yellow TheraBand because that is the amount of load that their tissue can tolerate at the moment. But progressive overload has to happen throughout this continuum. So out of what we would consider the rehab phase, then into more just sort of a training phase. But during the training phase, it continues as well. So when I talk to, I run a strength club at my clinic and a lot of it's just sort of people who've, you know, quote unquote, graduated from PT, but want to get stronger. And one of the first things I tell them is like heavy is completely subjective. So we're going to make you, you're going to lift heavy, but it's whatever is heavy for you. So heavy for one person in the room might be 10 pounds and heavy for the person standing next to her might be 60 pounds. And that's perfect. That's exactly right. And the, the biggest uh, criteria for all of them is just that they don't stop at that 10 pounds for the next six months, right? Because the 10 pounds won't be heavy anymore, right? Heavy is a moving target, I guess is the best way to mm -hmm. sum it up. And I think that's sort of what, what a lot of women in particular, especially because we've sort of been fear mongered around lifting anything heavy. Uh, we have this idea that it looks like a certain thing, but it's got much more to do with these, you know, quite frankly, some somewhat dull criteria, like how hard are you working and how many reps do you feel like, you know, it's very sort of like Excel spreadsheet. -y, yeah. you know? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't have to be dramatic to, to make a difference. It just has to, you know, we, we, we qualify it and, and then we, and then we keep going. Right. That's the biggest part. I love that strength is a moving target. Progressive mm -hmm. overload doesn't have to mean 500 pounds. It is how you are, but, but maybe the thing to remember, of course, is yeah, that it is a moving target and hopefully there we are seeing progress, whether that's just moved from the one pound to the two pound or kept that one pound, but was able to do more reps or a different slower reps, right? Time under tension and things like that. So I hope this is very inspiring to people listening to this of just the myriad of things that we've named in this conversation of get stronger, whatever that means for you. So lift heavy things, whatever that means for you. It's not exclusive. Strength training is not exclusive to yoga or yoga doesn't, yoga won't solve everything <laughs> for our physical needs for sure. Um, and that you're not a bad yogi or yoga teacher if you are strength training and you don't need to. And I wonder too, sometimes, even just as I said that, I just felt like I heard the reams of yoga teachers <laughs> in our world and listening. And <laughs> and sometimes there's like that excitement. One of you said that earlier about the honeymoon period of something. I think that was you, Laurel, who was like, when you first start t doing yoga or whatever it is, and there's that honeymoon period. And I think a lot of teachers who maybe do start strength training are like, oh, oh, this is wonderful, fresh, fun, and mm -hmm. new. Maybe this is what I have to start teaching or talk about. Uh -huh. And again, like maybe, maybe that will be the case for you, but it's, again, they're, they're separate and they're different, but yet they're the same. And you don't have to throw your yoga baby out with the bathwater in order to have the diversity of experiences that our body and our mind needs. And so is there anything else that in your experiences that you'd want to leave people with? around strength training it can be fun and joyful and silly and happy and it's i think for me when sarah was like i picture this big guy in the olympics with the bar bending like for me when i would conceive of strength i would just think of like sort of aggressive bro-y like shouting at you like more 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 type energy and I guess what I would like to say is it could be super girly and feminine and non-binary and it can be kind of goofy and fun. Like what I loved about the yoga community was how, well, I was in New York City and it attracted a lot of performers, but like just the characters that were practicing yoga was just like a menagerie of just like big personalities who were also like working on themselves, right? And you know what? Strength training can also be that it doesn't have to be such a different scene. It's really about who you do it with <laughs> and what they represent and, you know, their worldview. And it's so it doesn't have to be this scary, you know, clunking weights in a gym with big dude. It's that's not, you know what I mean? It's not what it necessarily is. 
depends on where you go and who you see. Yeah. And I, and I think to Laurel's point, there's a lot of women who are put off for that reason, because the gym is intimidating, right? And the, the bro-ness of it, not just women, in fact, anyone can be put off by the sort of aggressive, like s sense that there's sort of an aggressive energy that like, you don't belong here. If you yeah. don't look and sound like these people, you, this is not a place for you. And it really depends. Some women take that as like a fun personal challenge and just kind of like stomp on in and they're like, move over dudes. <laughs> and for other people, for other people, it's, uh, it's a little more intimidating. And so they, they might give up before they begin. Um, but yeah, I, I, I also want to say like the, you know, I, I like, like one of my favorite things to do is just kind of poke myself in the leg and feel how much, like I can feel how much stronger my muscles are. Like they're more dense and I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like I really enjoy that. So, so there's a lot of things that you can enjoy, uh, in terms of like how it's going to change your body in the way the body feels, but then also how you feel in your body, you know, like just the simple thing, like I'm checking out at the, at the Petco and the guy behind the counter says, do you need help with that 30 pound bag of dog food? And I literally sling it over my shoulder and I go, no, thanks. And I walk out of there and I'm like, yes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so feeling your own strength in the rest of your, you know, world and life, uh, can be really, can be really satisfying. And it does also change, you know, we talk a lot about this. It changes how you move through the world. It gives you more confidence. It lets you say things like no, and then just walk away without having to qualify that no with a million, you know, other sentences. And then just saying yes, because you had such a hard time with the no, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But, um, you know, it, it, to be in a body that functions really well, it's a political act. It really is for a woman. And being strong is a political act because you are no longer at the mercy of this narrative that tells you, that's not what you're supposed to be. I saw this really funny tweet and then response where the tweet was like, I think the person was talking about like, you know, getting, uh, they were, they were trying to like make a point that some feminists w want all the men to go away. And so this was a man writing this tweet and he said something like, if all the men are gone, who's going to protect the women? And a woman responded and she went, protect us from who? Which I thought was really funny. <laughs> But, you know, it, it can be the sort of thing that, that just like, you walk with a different spring in your step, you, you just sort of move through your world in a different way. And, and it's been a noticeable change for me. And um, I think for Laurel as well, I don't want to speak for her. But um, so that's there's, there's so many benefits beyond just like being able to poke yourself in the leg and being like, yeah, that feels really strong. I mean, that's fun. But like, there's lots of other in, in the same way, in, in similar way to yoga, there are benefits that are there that go far beyond just the physical. Yes. Agreed so much. And that is in that, that sense, I love how you framed the, this is a radical act and this is how we're dismantling the patriarchy by being subverting those gender norms and taking back and literally reclaiming our power through feeling powerful, through lifting something heavy. It's no small feat. And I think, whether you lift heavy things and think of that or not, this is what's happening. <laughs> and then how about the uh, fun last note then, is there a lift currently that you're loving? Mm, yes. I, um, oh, <laughs> Laurel, you know, Laurel right away. Uh, yes. <laughs> I, when I go to the gym, I go to the Y now. I joined the Y because I needed to get out of my office. This is, <laughs> I'm speaking to you from the place that I strength train people online and um, I'm like, I gotta get out of here. So I joined the Y and I love the calf raise machine. Can we talk about the calf raise machine? Because when you do calf raises and you don't have a $3,000 calf raise machine, you know, you're holding onto the weights or I have like a weight belt that I tie around me and like chain a, like a giant kettlebell onto. And then you got to like walk and the kettlebell's like swinging <laughs> back and forth. And you're like, this is attractive. <laughs> And, you know, and, and then I'm like doing my calf raises and that's all well and good. You go to the calf raise machine and it's got these like soft pads for your shoulders and you can adjust the height and you get into it and you can go like two at the same time. So you like, because you can use the stack plates to like really load yourself up, 
so that you don't have to go one foot at a time if you're a little short on time, right? You can make it bilateral and still have plenty of load to add. And I just like banging out those calf raises and like, I love the stretch of my Achilles and calves at the bottom as I drop my heels low and then, you know, lift up. And I, I'm deep into running right now. I've gotten back into running and like calf raises are definitely like what I consider like a running vitamin. And so the, the calf raise machine has just completely revolutionized my relationship to calf raises. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Amazing. I love that. I love that. How about you, Sarah? I was going to say, um, you know, deadlift is my perennial favorite. I could deadlift every day if it was an appropriate thing to do. But what I've been recently working more on is an overhead press with a barbell. Uh, because why not? You know, I've done plenty of all the other stuff. So that's that's been a lot of fun working on, on that. Because that has a, like a really specific technique. Because you got to get your head out of the way. But then you got to really quickly put it back in the way. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been nerding out on, on overhead press with the barbell and I'm like, yeah, let's start some, let's get some PRs going here. How much can you do? It turns out not that much, but you know, we'll get somewhere. <laughs> I've got, I've got plenty of room for improvement. So that's what I've been doing a lot of. Oh, that's so funny. I love that you say overhead press. Cause that you just rem reminded me that's one that I do of all movements, because there's something so like about it and if you haven't noticed already I, I have an inner gym bro that I like yeah. bring out in a playful way I'm also like that on the mountain bike I have like an inner mountain bike bro where I'm like yeah I yeah anyway so it's just I think all those years of being a good yogi yes. <laughs> bring this other side. but there's something about that overhead press where if I'm doing it quite often I have this thought and I always do this kind of this meditation and it sounds funny, but I think about like the women in the Victorian times. I think about women through the ages who have not been strong and something about that overhead press. I'm like, I'm doing this for you, bitches. See, bitches I'm being a, here's my bro coming out. So Listen up, Victorian bitches. I'm doing this for you. That's amazing. Yeah, but it is. There's something about lifting something heavy over your head that feels very yeah. triumphant. You know, you're like, yeah, yeah. And you've got your whole body solid and it's just your yeah. arms. I'm not doing a push press. And I'm like, yeah, look how strong I am for you. I'm doing this for all the women who couldn't have done anyway. So yeah, something about that awesome. one. So I love that you said that. Cause I, so there's that meditative side that can come out of <laughs> our, and the healing and the inner work. And actually even I'll just throw that one last thing in too, for me, um, especially my early days of lifting and the same with like learning mountain biking or any of these challenging things that I never, I'm not a badass. I'm not a badass. I'm such a badass. But growing <laughs> up, I wasn't somebody, how Laurel, how you were like, I was an athlete and da, da, da. I, it took some of these physical things of me. It just, I guess I had this story in my head of like, I'm not blank. Mm -hmm. And then I started doing these things. I'm like, oh, maybe I can do this. And I'd have this, this dialogue in my head being, if you could hear my head in the early days, I'd actually and even be doing like a heavier lift. If I'm, I also love doing back squats lately and like really loading it up and pushing myself and cause it's like, talk about hello, you know, that deadlift, you can just drop it, but a back squat, all systems on. And so then I'm like getting into that bar and I'm like, I'm so fucking strong. I got this. I'm so strong. Then I repeat this and I'm serious. I repeat yes. this in my head and it, and it works, I think, you know, and I was the same with like, I can go over this route, you know, I've, I've got this. And I, and I, and I love that little opportunity that doing these challenging things offers us to really pump ourselves up. So I hope maybe that's an added benefit for anybody listening that it's like, don't be afraid to be your best cheerleader. I love yeah. that self-talk opportunity because I, in some ways, I don't know if I ever really did that in yoga because it was like, and breathe, hold right. this warrior too for a long time. And yes, your leg's about to burst into flames because you've been holding that leg, like warrior two for a long time, but breathe. And I think there's something so cathartic about like, yeah, I'm so strong. Here we go. So on totally. that note, I hope that excites everybody and let us know. I actually have a feeling if, if you listen to this and this was your tipping point into either lifting heavier than you thought 
for starting to strength train, come on to our social medias and please tell us in your excitement. If you don't have anybody in your life, you're like, oh my God, I did a PR. I started doing this. We want to hear it. I will say this for Sarah and Laurel. They're nodding. Yes. I think we're all of the mind and the type of people to be your like cheerleaders for this. So let us know if this inspired you and we will happily pat you on the back or encourage you for more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, this was wonderful. I'm grateful to hear your both of your perspectives and the work that you're doing in the world. And of course, we'll be linking uh, the movement logic stuff. We will be linking all of your like your bone density. So if people do want to learn how to lift more weights and what what a barbell is, how can I work with a barbell? Well, these two are your people and having listened to them, like who wants better coaches than these two, right? This is the kind of anti-bro experience that the world needs more of. So thank you both for doing what you're doing and continue to share and just look at strength in all these beautiful, powerful ways. Thank you, thank you. Brie. Thank you so much for everything you do as well. I yeah, really respect the way you show up on social media, and hopefully someday we get to meet IRL. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> that would agree. Be I amazing, know. Laurel. I think a group we'll trip to Vancouver because yes. I've go. never been there, <clears throat> and I hear it's Please. beautiful. Please, Bree, yes. we're coming over. Um, yes. yes, we'll be there You'll later. We're going to be doing a, a group training session. So uh, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> done and done. Right. Open the arms to the side. Reach, reach, reach. Rotate back to center and then reach your arms out to the side, sliding the left hand down, right arm up, and we're gonna do a little side bend here. Inhale, come up. 